won't do any more of this ridiculous intro stuff uh, going forward, but okay, maybe I will, we'll see. So I started the sketch phase of this one in a different dimensioned file you can see here. This is more of the normal dimensions I work with, but uh, Larry and this piece were done in the Village Corrupted Dimensions, which is 10 inches by 12 inches at 300 dpi, which is 3000 pixels by 3600 pixels. You can see here that what we've got is the same thing that we did with Larry with the head size. We've got this at a very heroic proportion. She's, she would be way bigger than your average woman would be. Uh, and obviously she is like a beast lady. So that's what we're going for. We're going for big. We're going for heroic. We're going for a little monstrous. So are we at the full monstrous level that uh, Larry's at? Not quite as far as head is concerned, but then when you start taking into account the fact that she has like an oversized mouth, she has giant hands, you could imagine she has giant feet, um, she actually is kind of monstrous. Uh, she also has a slightly elongated neck so that we can get that big furry mane thing going up around her neck, and that is all ways to sort of distort and pull and push her anatomy so that we can get a somewhat monstrous, interesting character. Now, Let's start talking about the genesis of all of these characters now, now that we've got two going. Uh, we had Larry, who was sort of a bit of an, not an accident, but just not necessarily meant to be part of a lineup. And then I thought, hey, you know, Larry's got this kind of interesting, almost Frankenstein vibe, even though that was never the intent. Uh, what if we also did a character that had a bit of a Wolfman vibe? Uh, but I'm not really trying to replicate the Wolfman. It's more about if we're going to lump a character like Frankenstein, or Frankenstein's monster, I should say, right? Otherwise, I'm going to get that crowd coming after me. Um, if we take the creature and we say uh, undead, we just generify it big undead or something like that then we get a character like Larry. We're doing the same thing here. We're generifying, uh, genericizing, generic, generic. We're making generic uh, the notion of just a animal bestial human. Obviously something that's been done before, but we're doing it in this context now to try and uh, just create this new lineup of characters, basically. Um, so here we were almost done with the rough. You can see that the decisions I made, some of them are fairly standard, like we're going to group some fur along the back of the arm. We're going to give big pointy ears. Um, we're going to put some fur instead of skin. She's got like a, just basically a, f a thin fur over her entire body kind of thing. Um, but then we're going to try and find opportunities to do some other fun things, like that fur that's on the back of her arms. What if it goes all the way around her wrist and onto her hand and it's like really big and pronounced so that we get an interesting silhouette out of it with the hair what if we make it this giant big mass behind her which in some ways is also referencing like felicia from darkstalkers which i didn't take direct inspiration from darkstalkers on these characters but the fact that some people have commented that they kind of feel like they're from that i mean that's no mistake in the sense that like darkstalkers is one of the greatest lineups of characters ever and i've always been inspired by that since that game came out so i i wouldn't say i was going for it but like no doubt i'm i'm inspired by it like just as a natural thing i'm inspired by dark stalkers if i'm just even drawing like somebody waiting for the train like i just love all of that so where we're at now with this character, this, by the way, is like a bit of a color key, uh, trying to explore the colors before we actually start going into the flats. I did it because I just wanted to get to the idea real fast and look at it. It wasn't really that I was trying to validate anything. It was more just like I didn't have time to do proper flats, but I wanted to have an image that I could stare at and just think about what I wanted to do with her. Notice that there's some aspects of this that are not... Uh, the way they are in the final. For instance, I have darkening on the palm of her hand instead of lightening on the palm of her hand. I also don't have some of the other fur colorations and things like that in there because this is all just me sort of going with my initial gut. And then later when I come in to do the flats, which is about to start in a second, uh, I'm thinking a lot more instead of just doing what feels like it is the obvious thing to do. I'm trying to actually more explore things. Uh, so what we did now is all of those layers that we had that were flats, uh, that were the flat keys, we are going in and cleaning up. Those were laid in in a really bad order. They were just done like really haphazardly. So now I'm being a lot cleaner about it. 
previously the flats were like for instance like the flats for her hair was like on top of everything which is super unmanageable since that's a big mass that's behind her we might as well put it behind her so that's what we're doing now we're repainting it the fact that you see that little darkening in the hair is like at the top it's getting painted over now is because I just had that layer on top with a lowered opacity so I could remember everything it's always nice to sort of keep these tools at your disposal and I mean tools like if you can make something lowered in opacity because it just comforts you that it's there, uh, do it. I mean, it's the same reason why we do lines first, right? Because it gives us comfort, it gives us planning, it gives us some sort of uh, anchor that we're then like saying, it's a reference point for us to say like, okay, this goes here, that goes there. So I'm lowering the opacity on it and coloring under it. I was gonna say over it, but it's technically under it. And then we'll delete it eventually. Eventually, all of that will get deleted. All of the uh, color key stuff will get deleted. So as these flats continue to layer in, uh, let me talk a little bit more about the design and the sort of theory behind the character, I guess. <clears throat> there is, the original idea was, okay, we've kind of got a little bit of a Frankenstein. What if we kind of get a little bit of a werewolf? I wouldn't call her, though, a werewolf. I would say that she's more of a beast person or a beast lady. There's aspects of her that are a little cat, a little wolf, a little whatever. She's just supposed to be sort of generic. She is uh, covered in fur. She has claws. She has pointy ears. She has some sort of an animalistic nose. And the specifics of what animal she's kind of like crossed with are irrelevant. The idea, though, is that she is a beast. She is a monster character. And uh, I really personally am happy with the contrast between her and Larry. I think that uh, they look really good together. I think their colors complement each other pretty nicely. I also think that their proportions being what they are really complement each other. And if you keep up with my Instagram, you'll know that there's another character that I've posted. Um, she also, I think, is a nice complement to the other two. And we've got a couple more in the works, but I kind of blew my wrist out the other day doing something stupid. I was just drawing in like a stupid position. And so I've been taking a break just to make sure that that doesn't get any worse. Uh, and then I'll be getting back to the other characters. We've got, I've got two more that have been like sketched up. I actually have three that have been sketched up, but one of them I'm not happy with because what I want to do with this lineup now is I want to start thinking about what the story could be, but more than a story, these characters are representing essentially archetypes. The way that I think about a character lineup, um, I guess to try and use some sort of analogy, it's like a car. It's like, I don't need a wheel that looks like that wheel, but I need four wheels. And I don't need an engine that performs like that other engine, but I do need an engine. And so when you think about a cast like that, I like to have some sort of a healthy mix where you feel like all of the holes have been plugged. It's like we get, <clears throat> to use really just generic terms right now, We've got the big brute guy. Um, maybe he's also intelligent. Maybe he's the leader. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's the dumb, the dumb heavy lifting guy. Okay, maybe, but visually he's the big guy. Then we've got this character, Hazel. She looks like she could even also be the leader a little bit. She certainly looks confident. She looks focused. Um, she has the stature to compare herself with somebody like Larry, because that was always the idea also that I wanted the two of them to both kind of feel like they were on equal footing as far as like representation in the, the story or in the cast of characters goes. Then as far as what she looks like she could physically do, she looks like, in like sort of video game terms, she looks like she's like DPS. Uh, maybe she's actually, actually a little bit more well balanced. What if we had a character that was smaller than her and just covered in spikes? That character would feel more like DPS and then she would feel a little bit more balanced because she's bigger, she looks tougher, and she looks like she deals out a lot of damage. So I'm sort of thinking of these, these two characters as trying to um, be the start of this car where I'm saying like, okay, he, I need four wheels. There he is. I need 
the engine. There she is. Uh, this thing needs a steering wheel. Who's the steering wheel? And so I'm not trying to say that like a character represents a steering wheel. It's just that when you're done with the cast, you should feel like it is complete. You should feel like you completed the car. And so when we talk about the third character who will be coming this week, actually, um, she'll be coming on Friday. Um, that character, com it's another part of that vehicle. And then as we go to the next character, it's like I could say to myself, for instance, like, hey, do I need a vampire character? Let's throw a vampire character in there. But then if I'm designing the vampire character and it feels like he's not adding to a dynamic, he's not an interesting idea, she, she, he, whatever, isn't anything. I say he or she because I sketched a male and my son was like, it should be a girl. And I was like, okay, but I, so now I don't know what I want to do. I don't even know, although it would break my kid's heart, if I want a vampire in the lineup. Because I like the notion of kind of lightly referencing uh, these these monsters, but I don't want it to be perfectly on the nose. In fact, when you see the next character, if you haven't already, you'll see that she is not perfectly on the nose. She kind of fits an archetype, but not exactly. And so that's what I'm trying to make sure that I'm keeping up with this whole thing. So... We've got Larry, we've got Hazel here, we've got Lucy, she's the other character, and then we're going to have at least two more characters, um, probably a little bit more because I'm just really into this lineup, I'm into these characters right now, and when I'm done with all of these, it should feel like I've referenced the right amount of things, I've invented new the right amount of things, and that from like a personality slash function perspective, I have covered all my bases. Now, that's the way I think about it, because the way I'm trying to think about it is like a lineup of video game characters or a, or a cast for a cartoon or whatever, like that's kind of how I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking of it as being complete. So you could also do it differently, right? You could theoretically design a cast that is missing components and the idea is that you fill in those components maybe as the story goes on or whatever and maybe that's the interesting thing that you want to tell you want to tell a story where something feels off something feels like it's not clicking and then a character gets introduced and it's like ah now it feels better i mean there's a million ways to to pursue these creative things so from my perspective right now because it's a nice way for me to lay the groundwork i can just say like okay let's just design all the characters and try to get as many of them together as i can figure out where that interesting play is and then say like do i have enough here to tell the story that i would want to tell um, since I've mentioned it, and since I'm talking about building like an IP basically here, um, for lack of a less grandiose word, um, a Village Corrupted, a lot of people still ask me about that, especially since I'm doing sort of like this new lineup of char characters. I just want to give everyone an update there. I have started like writing the thing. Um, I don't want to get into like the details of it, of course, and th that's probably irritating to some of you, but um, I'm working on it and that is still a thing that it's going to be. Uh, from an art perspective, this is a very different vibe, so I'm just having a lot of fun with it. And this will be some other like little fun thing I do. And then over time, one of them is gonna win out as to what thing I want to pour more work into. But the A Village Corrupted stuff, and I'm going to keep calling it that because that's what the very first piece was called. It's never, it's not going to be called that when all is said and done because the original story was about literally a village and, and it becoming, not really so much it becoming corrupted, but its environment becoming corrupted. That story is like, has morphed into something completely different. This, but, but I know what it is, and that's the important part. This story is literally a lineup of characters. Um, I've talked to my wife about it because my wife likes to write. Um, she doesn't write anything where she like actually puts it out into the world, although I think she's almost done with like a book she's been working on. But the point is, is that as a writer, I like talking to her and just spitballing these ideas. And I think it's really easy to get into the trap of saying like, okay, clearly these monsters are part of a team. It's like the BPRD or Monster Squad or some sort of 
thing like that. I think it's really easy to go that route and I don't really want to go that route. I think that stuff is super cool. And if somebody's inclined to say like, oh yeah, that would be cool. I don't disagree with you. I think that that as a general idea is cool. I just don't know if that's really where I want this to go. So I'm still trying to figure out like I got Larry. He's cool. I got Hazel. She's cool. I got Lucy. She's cool. I got two, three more characters sketched up. They're cool and ready to go. And then it's like, to do what? They're ready to go to do what? Right now they're just ready to go to look cool, but they need to do more than look cool. So we'll we'll get there. So my philosophy on designing characters. I have talked about this a little bit in the past. Let's talk about it while we stare at this character getting her AO pass done. This, I, I, I sometimes lump uh, character design into a, a few buckets. Um, I've actually, you know, gone on like a tear before around my my how I feel it should be done or what all of that, and it, that's just obnoxious shit. Um, so let's just talk about the way I do it and how I like to uh, build my like cast. Let's say so. I am what I refer to as like a head down character designer. I start with the head. I think about their face. I think about their emotions. I think about kind of like how would they look saying this line? Would they, can they emote? Can they connect with the, the viewer? And then the silhouette comes after that. The silhouette and the design of the character follow that. I think that like pure silhouette design is usually more of a costume design tactic. And if you've got like a character who you know needs to deliver lines and connect with the viewer and be a person, be something, a sentient being, like you have to start with the face. Now, if you start with the face and have zero idea of what the body is going to look like, of course you're going to have to start doing some body explorations, which can involve sketches or silhouette or whatever. But usually when you're designing the face, it's not like you have zero idea of what the body's going to look like. If an uh, art director comes up to you and says, we need a new character, this character is going to be a werewolf, go. And you start drawing the head, it's not like you're like, I have no idea what this body is going to look like. You know it's probably going to be furry, it's going to probably be muscular. It's got a lot of different body types you can then go with, but then even like the angle of the head and how you start positioning some of that, I think is going to start telling you that. Now, I'm not saying that you sit and you draw 400 heads and then three, month, three months into drawing 400 heads, you're like, okay, I've got my character. Let's design his body. I just mean like crank out that face first. Start coming up with something that you're going to identify with. And if those sketches end up trickling down into a body or whatever, that's totally fine. But what I caution against is doing pure silhouette studies right off the bat because you're not actually addressing the character. You're addressing just the read of a character from a distance. Um, there's going to be some people that probably would say like, right, but like in this context, that's good. Or in that context, that's good. And that's absolutely fine. I'm sure there are contexts where that's good. I'm not really talking about uh, designs that are supposed to be um, for like a, a monster. Like if you're playing, what's a good example? If you're playing Dark Souls and you see like a monster in the distance, that char that monster is probably best to be designed as a silhouette first because that is how you're reading them. You need to communicate what they can do. You, you need to communicate. But like, honestly, I kind of separate that as a separate thing. I can I consider that a monster design or a creature design, something that isn't truly supposed to be sentient, something that isn't supposed to deliver lines, something that isn't supposed to be something that the player connects with. It's more of a shape that the player identifies and has to figure out how to combat and has to recognize it from a different one, etc, etc. But I do consider it um, a different bucket. So I guess if I were to try and split things into different things, it's like if we're talking characters, I consider a character to be a a a character that's it's hard to find another word for character. Let's just say it's someone in a story that has to be uh, operating as like a main cast member, someone who talks, someone who looks, someone who interacts with the other characters, someone who is, doesn't have to be humanoid, but like humanoid as far as like its mentality goes, which again is why I say sentient, they have to be, they're usually sentient. 
And from that perspective, I think that that's why drawing from a connection point of view first is more important than a silhouette. Silhouettes, I think, are easy to solve compared to designing like someone who feels uh, like they matter, someone who feels like you can care about them. Now that's a long rant, so I want to cap it at the end by just saying that that's how I feel. I think th the way I feel about that is um, how I feel sort of about all forms of art, which is like just do what works for you ultimately. But if you're a beginner, I think it's a good way, it's a good thing to think about. Let's put it that way. Think about the perspective that I just laid down. Think about the perspective of people who do silhouettes as their main go to for like character design. Think about all the different techniques, try all of them and figure out what's good for you. So I don't wanna make that sound like it's a rant that's like, fuck everyone who does this, this is the right way to do it. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say that like, I found that if you have a list of parameters that you're trying to nail with a character design, that that's a better way to go about it than the other. Um, but again, mileage may vary, everyone do, what you need to do in order to get there um, and at the end of the day the hope is that everybody's designing cool characters so let's close off that part for now and go back to talking about the actual piece so what are we doing here um, in the the painting uh, we're doing the the soft shadow AO pass where we're defining the forms and all that kind of stuff um, the way that these layers are broken up I'm not going to talk about all the layers but the thing that I think might be interesting is these little sort of like sprigs of fur that are across her body are actually painted as a separate piece um, they're like painted in the shape of the fur with a little bit of like a soft erasing happening to so that they fade into the fur the the like main fur so if you look at it as her let's say skin even though it's not skin like the top of her hand or like where her like the lower part of her bicep where it looks smooth my interpretation would be that would still be like a very very uh short layer of fur and then these bigger sprigs are like just bigger sprigs they're longer bits of fur so what we're trying to capture is that the longer her fur is in spots it gets a little bit darker and so that's the way that we're trying to do it with some of those um, little parts that are like sticking up here and there we're just doing that by painting the darker part and then fading it off into the quote-unquote skin fur I guess you could say and really I like that vibe as opposed to actually going in and making sure everything reads like fur just because I like it to be more stylized. I think it reads cleaner overall. It just feels, um, I don't know, a little bit more stylish and something that I, I like a little bit more. I, I mean, going back to that reference earlier about Darkstalkers, I mean, I guess like Felicia, like her paws and her ears and stuff are technically furry and you could you could paint them as though they're just like cat fur, but they're usually not represented that way. They're usually represented more in solid masses with little bits of fur sticking up here or there. And for me, that's just a cooler look. I just, I just think it looks neat. So I'm going for something similar to that here. So in the, this, since this is the second character, the second character is put in an interesting position. At least I feel like this whenever I'm doing the type of lineup like this. The same thing happened with the Village Corrupted stuff is you do the first character. The first character is really cool. It resonates with you for some reason. So then you say to yourself, I want to do more. I want to do more of these. I want to grow this. But the second one is all about like, it's like you've got all this energy and you're like, I want to hit it again. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to make it be as cool as the first one? What are the elements I'm going to keep versus not? And something that I thought was kind of neat about Larry was that he had this almost like lasery vibe about him. Like, that's the best word I can say. He's got like a laser quality. And it's because he's got those, those purpley pink glowy bits, right? And I think that a lot of the time, glowy bits and really cool lighting is a big part of monster stuff but with him it felt a little bit more kind of like i don't know like techno-y like a little bit more neon something that had a, a, a again like a laser vibe i can't really put it any differently and so i thought when i was doing this one that i wanted to keep that 
So I said to myself, what's the thing on her that can have that vibe? And as you saw very early in the color keys, it was like her nails and her eyes. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to find, is there something in this world that can be like a bit of a constant? Is there something that can be part of these the design of these characters that is similar through all of them? Uh, you could look at something really simplistically, uh, like let's say... Uh, the X-Men, like the or the beginning X-Men, like they all wear the same costume, so you know they're all part of a team. It's a really just simple, straightforward way to say these characters all come from the same place and they're part of the same thing. Now, when you're trying to do something like that with things that are more natural, it can be a little bit harder. Uh, I can't think of an example right off the top. Okay, think of like, let's say, a few World of Warcraft characters. At this point, World of Warcraft's look and feel is so like obvious but think about like three players who are wearing completely different armor and they have to stand next to each other and they have to look like they're all from the same place they're not going to have a hallmark like wearing all the same yellow and blue leotard or whatever they're not going to have those things they're going to be wearing armor that represents all these different classes and factions and all this so they had to find what their constants were. And I think that just to be overly simplistic about it, it's like really big shoulder pads, oversized hands, like, uh, I don't know, very dimensional, ornate, but heavy uh, embellishments, like things like that, right? I think we can all identify World of Warcraft's look and feel, and we could probably all generate something where we're like, it's like this. Um, and I think that it's, it's clear, but it's also extremely diverse in far, as far as what they're trying to represent. Um, oh, let me pause on this for a second just to talk about what I'm doing here, because I did something slightly different with the shirt this time. Since I had the rough sketch of her boobs just as they are without the shirt, what I decided to do was, because they're pulling at the shirt, right, is I, want, I decided to just paint them as if the shirt wasn't there, and then on a new layer, paint the stretches of the fabric across them and then go back in and erase the shadows that I had created that were too form-fitting because it's like vacuum sealed, right? It's like a superhero outfit, which is super unrealistic. And then, um, so then I erase away those vacuum seal qualities and then I merge the two layers together. And so what you see right now happening is like, it's the it's the vacuum seal. And in a second, you're gonna see me start adding in the stretching across, and then you'll see me erase it, uh, erase the original away. And I think that the reason I did it is because I wanted to get it right. So here we go, you can see me now painting in the more stretchy parts. I wanted to get it right. I really wanted to sell the dimensionality. And I think that all of the other parts of this were actually really easy to get that done um, because the rest of it's kind of just form fitting, like the pants and stuff. And so sometimes when I'm dealing with all of these shadow layers and stuff, it's like, okay, what's the cleanest way for me to get there? And so I thought at the time that this would be the cleanest way to get there. So I just wanted to highlight that as like a way to kind of try and get around um, my own inability to kind of like paint it on the fly and instead do it in a way that involves stages so that I didn't like screw it up basically. So now you can see right there I just flipped it back and flipped it on and now it's where it's basically got to be. It's still going to get some extra refinement here or there and as the piece goes on it will but I thought that that was like a pretty good way to try and solve that problem. So back to what I was saying about the uh, the qualities that are the same. What are the constants, right? It doesn't have to be so obvious, but I thought it would be really fun if it was obvious. Sometimes making these like really obvious decisions where you're just saying like, uh, no, everyone in this has, uh, I don't know, a weapon that has a crystal in it, like some shit like that, right? Like you, you're trying to find this like common thread. Sometimes it's something that's really clear like that, really overt, and other times it's subtler. Um, like, for instance, the World of Warcraft example, or even more subtle, what if it's something like, I'm actually kind of making this up, I can't really think of a great example, but like, let's say Game of Thrones, it's like all those characters have to look like they exist in the same world, and they kind of feel, for the most part, like they're all part of the same world, but they aren't at all having these like really obvious, like not everyone has the exact same big buckle on their chest, or you know, some shit like that. Here... I think by making it really obvious and making it part of the coolness of the character, we can make it really fun. And at the end of the day, the funness is really what I want to sort of come out of these characters. I hope that when people look at these characters, they think that they're cool. 
Um, I'm not really interested in whether or not people feel like they are uh, sophisticated or the most unique thing ever or whatever. I think that it's really, this one is driven just by like fun. I want people to look at them and be like, oh, that's cool. I like, I like that. That's funny that he did that or that's fun that he did that or that's, um, that just looks like a fun thing. I don't want to overuse the word fun, but at the same time, I think we work really hard to try and make things like kind of overly special or we try to take things too far. We feel like we're having to justify things. And I think sometimes it can just be as simple as it's got to be fun. And uh, funness is something that people really respond to in general. So that's really what I'm going for here. And I think the next character too, you'll really see that. The next character is a little more lighthearted, uh, whereas this character and Larry are both a little more intense obviously not as intense as something that's like really hardcore or something like that but they they have a little bit more of an intense vibe and the next character lucy she's got more of like a a fun thing going on there so the common element that i was referring to is this sort of neon glowy thing that's happening we've got it in the glowy bits on larry we've got it on the uh, glowy claws and glowy eyes here and in the next character she has glowy bits as well they're all different colors i'm not necessarily trying to make it like power rangers where everybody's got like a completely different color thing in fact the character after lucy uh changes it up a bit and i think that the important thing is to try and find that right balance between it being fun and it being like easily grokkable and it being something that people are like oh i see like that color is kind of for that and that color is kind of for that without going so far that it's just like shit we already used red we can never use red again or you know like that type of thing that's the trap that i never really want to get myself into I think that if you can create like a range that that works but i don't really want to, these characters to get into a phase where it's like or a state i should say where it's like we did green we did yellow we did all these colors oh man we're out of colors like i'd rather have it instead just be a little bit more natural it's like maybe there will be another character that has this blue glowy thing happening maybe i've already designed that character um but the point is is that we uh try to find new ways to do it so that the characters still all feel like their totality is unique and it's not just about the glow it's not just the eyes glow or not just the claws glow um and that they glow this one specific color that's what i'm trying to kind of avoid i guess speaking of glow People have been asking me to talk a little bit about how I do glow. So at the end of this, we're going to do a really quick glow thing. It's it's actually going to be super fast because it's there's different ways you can do glow. And I've talked about this in the past, but I thought, let's just do a refresher. The way I do the glow for these is quite simple. Um, and I think that... Uh, I think that everyone's just going to like that because it's going to be like one of those quick tricks that it just is really simple and it kind of solves all your glow problems. So I'm going to speed up and let the rest of the AO pass roll and I'll come back in when we're doing the hard shadow. So I came in a little after uh, we started doing the hard shadow. I just wanted to let it breathe a little because I've been rambling a ton on this one. And uh, I hope it's been helpful. Um, please let me know if when I'm going on these tears, if that's like good or bad. Uh, what I want to try and do with these videos is I want to try and provide the sort of like insight as well as the technique and i feel like since we've covered the technique so much i try to cover other things so uh let me know if in fact it's uh helpful or not that way i know if if you want me to do those again in the future um also in the larry video i said that uh, i mean i covered character design and i was going to do some on this character, but since we've spoken so much about it, there's not really much for me to do as a breakdown. I think that 
the big things is the head height and we have an engaging character we've got a strong color palette and then we've got a overall silhouette that feels pretty strong with the glowy bits really accenting that so there's really not a whole lot to break down um, we're gonna go on I'll do more of a character design breakdown on the next character and then when we get a few of these characters kind of all done I'll just do like a separate a separate video entirely where I go through all the characters and sort of say like this is what these characters do for us this is why the lineup works really well and I think that that will um, it'll be better when it's in perspective of like more characters so what are we doing right now? We're doing the cast shadow. Um, all the shadows for this one and for Larry and for all of them are done with a purple shadow uh, instead of a warm shadow. Uh, so we've got a like light purplish gray. Uh, it's actually a color similar to like the palm of her hand right there, but a little lighter. And uh, that's what we're using for all the shadows. The highlights on this are also uh, done with blue, um, or a cool, I should say. But then we've got this yellowy rim light that's in the background. So we did that on Larry. And similarly to how we talk about the glow, what are the other consistent things we're going to do, I always kind of think about these types of character paintings like they're marketing. Um, from a character design perspective, completely rendering them doesn't necessarily give a whole lot of information. It absolutely can. For instance, if you're trying to define what a material is like or how a dimension of a form is or something like that, especially if it's going to go to like a modeler or, you know, something along those lines. Um, but usually, like the color blocking and the uh, the lines and the general just design of it is kind of enough. Uh, so then when you do these renderings, it's like, okay, this is kind of like something that we would put on a box or in marketing material or something. And to that end, I try to make sure that they all feel similar. So we already talked about the design of the character and how we're trying to make that feel similar, but we're also trying to do it with things like the lighting by using the same color for our shadows and our highlights and all that kind of stuff uh, and then doing the same thing for each one of them where we have like an off to the side light and then we've got like a rim light behind them from like a, a light that's coming from kind of above behind uh, and then we've also got these swirly bits and these sort of the colors in the background that are representing the the surrounding atmosphere, that's a good way to also build consistency across your characters uh, when you're doing a lineup like this. Now, I, I, I shouldn't really say lineup because I feel like if we're going to officially call something a lineup, they've got to be like full body and they've all got to be like in proportion with each other. But this is more of like a casual, illustrative, for funsies lineup. I do have an image where I've taken the three characters done so far and I've put them together. I had to kind of extend Larry's legs just a little bit to get it to work out, um, but it's kind of fun. They're all cut off like where it makes sense for them to be cut off so that they're all at the proper height. But at some point it might be fun to go in and actually finish off their bodies. One of the main reasons why I don't do as much full body work as some people maybe want is because with the resolution that I have to work at on Procreate, um, I feel like it's, I lose something. So I would rather kind of just do it like this. This is kind of how far out I prefer. This is the furthest out I prefer to be from a character. Um, and then if we ever need to extend it, I can throw it into Photoshop or do whatever, right? Um, to, to paint the rest of it, not a big deal. Now, what we're doing at this point in the uh, illustration is doing the lines for the hair doing it as a separate layer, uh, in a separate shadow layer, similarly to how we've done it in the past. If you've ever seen a video that I've done before where I do the different hair chunks and everything, it's the exact same thing. We're going into a new layer, painting in the shadow, and then smudging it so that we soften it in spots, kind of even smudge it away in spots, and then whenever we have that little split between two groupings of hair, we kind of smudge them together to create a little bit of a recession in there. In a second, you're gonna see purple flash across the whole screen. That's the actual color I'm using for shadow. What I'm doing there is I'm filling the canvas, selecting her entire form, clearing from that, blurring it, setting it to multiply, and then deleting the excess. And what that's doing is it's creating a vignetting around her entire form. Um, now the phase that you see me doing 
is I'm adding some more soft shadows to try and soften her form. So I'm going through the same select paint, select clear method, but I'm doing it with a really soft brush to give some extra rounding to all of her forms. Uh, the select paint, select clear, if you don't know what that is, I link it down below. You can check out that video. It's basically the method by which I go through my layers and apply these shadows to everything. So now we're switching to highlights. Uh, which again, this is with a like a turquoise. It's actually a color that's like a pale version of what her nails are, and then um, lower dramatically in opacity. With these pieces, with Larry, with Hazel, with Lucy, I am adding a little bit more of this softness to them to really render them out. Uh, but I'm also still painting everything with the turpentine brush. Something I've debated with myself is whether or not it's worth using the turpentine brush for this stuff because I could just as easily be doing this with more normal brushes and get probably the same look. But I think ultimately I just like the, the push and pull of the turpentine and I like uh, where I do get like little rough bits. I think that is still good. So even though I'm trying to bring in a little bit more refinement into these pieces, I think that sticking with the turpentine brush is still the way to go. But you can see, I think by adding some of that extra softness, we're getting a little bit more dimension out of the characters, and uh, that's helpful, especially when you've got characters like, for instance, her. She's even a little bit more so than Larry. She's got a lot of parts, and we're trying to really separate all of those parts and make it clear, um, and I think that it just helps to, to do that. So now we're adding the extra shine on the hair. You'll see that it's a little hot and I actually knock it back just a little more before the very, very end. But um, when I say a little hot, the opacity is a little too high. So it's kind of standing out a little too much. That'll eventually come down just a little bit more. Now in the past, I've talked a lot about skin variation, uh, vary, varying the skin color throughout a person's body because your skin is different colors all over your body. And uh, that's actually something that our brain is reacting to here that's really positive. You can see her stomach is a little lighter. That part kind of under her armpit is a little lighter. Her palm is a little lighter. And I think the human brain sees those variations in conjunction with the lighting and just likes it. I think there's just something really satisfying about that. So that's why I put that in to this character. I wanted to make sure that we still had that here so that we could um, get the the win of making this the skin fur quote unquote feel more natural as opposed to it being all one color. It's similar to if you're painting a human if you paint them the same color from head to toe they're going to look kind of plasticky uh, which if that's the look you're going for great. If you're not then it looks bad. So you try to find all of those opportunities like palms and tips of fingers and noses and ears and all that kind of stuff. Same thing is true with this character. We want to do the same thing by trying to find like okay she's this beast creature but can we find things that still gets us that so maybe her palms are a little lighter similar to how a dog or a cat's uh pads are light well they're not necessarily always lighter sometimes they're darker like my dog has black pot like black pads um so but anyways the point is you're looking for that you're looking for those opportunities and so things like that really really help I didn't do it in the fur um, because there was already so much noise there. I thought I could maybe add something to the tips of the fur, but it's just those the fur is so spiky and crazy that I didn't want it to get too noisy. So lastly, we are doing some bounce from down below. Uh, this is very similar to what we did on the Larry piece. So really, this is just us trying to say like, okay, we're identifying some more qualities in the other illustration to try and create um, a uh, consistency from illustration to illustration so we're going to do that here as well the third piece does the exact same thing so other than the design of the character and the effort it takes to render them in their unique with their unique geometry and their unique lighting setup uh, we're trying to repeat all these other things the rim light the strong rim light from the back this glow from below the the one light source that's kind of in front of them i mean that one light source. There's basically three light sources kind of at play here, um, as well as trying to capture all the bounce uh, that's happening here. And so trying to find the things that we can sort of say, this will be the same on all illustrations. And then that way the designs are the unique thing. 
So we're almost at the very end. It'll just come in a couple seconds, but um, these are this is the stage where we're just doing last minute tweaks, making sure there's like a noise layer on the background, making sure that all the glows are turned on correctly. Uh, Do we accidentally turn something off that we want to turn back on? lowering the intensity of a layer or increasing the intensity here we're adding just a little extra bounce glow off of the leg from the nails uh, and then we knocked we pulled back some of the hair shine right there and now this is the final piece so overall super stoked on this these have just been really fun characters to do um and uh hope to do many more as long as i have ideas worth it as i said earlier i kind of culled a couple ideas because i was like just doing them to do them and i'm like that's not at the level it needs to be um so we're going to quickly let's take a look at the two of these characters side by side so I think they work together quite well. Um, they're both in the exact same sort of like lighting range. Their environments are similar. We've got the idea of the rim lights. They both have these glowy elements. I mean, they look like they could definitely be uh, together in the same IP, and that's ultimately what we're going for. Let's take a quick break to talk about glows. Here we are doing another off-the-cuff, no-planning demo. Uh, as we're going to be talking about glows and the biggest thing with a glow is contrast. It's kind of like if you've ever seen a flame in just like broad daylight, you kind of can't really see it. Um, that's the thing, right? Like a glow is light and in order to see the light better, you need darkness. So let's just start by establishing the fact that this needs to be a dark environment. So let's just go real dark. Let's make it super simple. Now. We want something to glow. Let's just go, let's let's not stress out too much. Let's just go with something fairly simple. Let's get a ball, a circle. The old go-to. Of course, I could have like actually completed that circle a little bit better so that we have a complete circle. And yeah, let's go with that. Okay. Actually, you know what? Let's not do a circle. Let's, I mean, uh, let's not do like a, a filled in circle. Let's do more of like a ring. I think that will look, oops, I think that will look a little bit more interesting. I think we'll see a little bit more action going on there. So we've got this color. This is a super bright and, and saturated color. As you can see, we're in the top right. Not only are we in the top right, but it's a color that exists between two other colors, so it feels more interesting. It's kind of like if we were to put it here, or if we were to put it here, or if we were to put it like in some of these spots that are just these sort of like electric colors, right? So we're going with this color because it's going to be nice and fun to make it glow. Now, how do we make it glow? There's Here's the, the super easy step one basic ass glow. And this is not what I did for Larry, but it is what I did for Hazel. Duplicate, all of her uh, bits that glow were on the topmost layer of the stack. So I didn't have to worry about them getting occluded by anything else. So we've got here, you can just see we've got a duplicate of it. And then we go over here to Gaussian Blur and we just blur it and boom, it's glowing. There's nothing more that you need to do to do this type of a glow. Now, you might say to yourself, that's cool, I like that glow, but can we do like more glows? Are there different glows that can be done? Of course there are different glows that can be done and it's all going to be based on what it is you're trying to achieve. I wouldn't necessarily build a flame glow the exact same way I would build a neon glow or something like that. Or you might want to get a different just quality to your glow. So as like a first step, let's just take this, let's just experiment. We're not even going to say that this is right or wrong ways. We're just going to call it different ways. Um, we're going to take this glow. I'm going to duplicate it just so I don't lose it for a second. Um, I'm turning off the other one though. You can see right there. So we've got the same glow from before and it's now under. Obviously it being under or over changes nothing when it's the exact same color. But what if we wanted that glow to go a little bit more towards blue? Ah, that kind of changes the vibe of the glow quite a bit, doesn't it? Let's uh, go between the two. We've got that one, and we've got that one. That one, and that one. The interior color right here, this hasn't changed at all, but the vibe of the whole thing has changed because we've gone with this more blue-blue as opposed to a green-blue for the glow. 
you could also take that glow. Let's go ahead and put it back on top. Now you can see, of course, it's impacted the actual color of the ring. And if we want, we can set that to an add. Then we can turn on that old one again and we get this like crazy bright glow right here, right? You can also go to like a color dodge and see how it changes. Add, color dodge, add, color dodge, normal. There's also lighten, uh, which is okay. Uh, lighten is good for some things. It doesn't really change anything here, you can see. Um, and but the, but the point I wanna highlight here is the glow that I'm doing here is really, really rudimentary. It's just taking that color and duplicating it and blurring it. And then you can play with all of these other effects like an add or a lighter color. Overlay doesn't really do much in this case. You actually have to supplement it with another layer underneath and set that to like a normal. And now you can see better the impact that that's having. Now, again, I'm not gonna say what I'm about to do is like the absolute slam dunk. This is the perfect glow, but let's talk about another way that we could do this glow. Let's duplicate it and blur it from scratch. Let's go really big with the blur. So we've got like a big soft glow. Let's definitely make that glow more of like a blue and put it underneath. Okay, we've got an interesting vibe there. Now let's duplicate this one again, and we're gonna blur it again, but we're gonna blur it way less. So we've got now a tight glow that's around it. So what we've done is we've essentially established that we have this big soft blue, and then we have this tighter, harsher blue that's closer to the actual, I mean, it's the exact same blue as the glow itself. If we turn off that big blue, you can see the vibe that you now get. And if we turn off that tighter one, you can see the vibe that we get. It's like, the, it really dramatically changes things. You could even go a little bit further. And let's just say we switch to white for a second here. And right in the middle of this, we draw another circle. So I'm just gonna go all the way around and then hold it so that we get that circle. I'm gonna take my other finger and hold it down so that we get a perfect circle. I'm gonna get it approximately right and then I'm gonna hit edit shape at the top so I can just move it now exactly where I want to. Now you can't really size it like this. You can pull on all of these different, you can pull on these dots, but it's not like a uniform size. Let's just go with that, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna duplicate this just so that I don't lose it. What if we blur that a little bit? Oh my God, I just lost my voice, <clears throat> excuse me. What if we blur that a little bit and we get something like that? Is that something we want? Let's duplicate it again. So what have we done now? We've actually added a little bit of dimension now to the thing that's glowing. It no longer registers just as a flat disc that is glowing. It has something there. Is that white telling us that that is a curved tube and we're now looking at the top of it? Or is it telling us that there's some sort of a fuzzy glow in the middle of it? It could be doing any of those things. Uh, this is a very abstract scenario, so it depends. If we take that layer and switch it to an add and lower its opacity a little, we can also start playing with what it actually means for the colors and we can start trying to communicate different vibes. Now, the reason why I'm trying to stay a little bit generic about this and using words like vibes and all that is because the range of glow that anybody's trying to ever achieve can be like so vast. We can very generically say glow, but as I mentioned earlier, there's like neon light and flame and something that's ethereal. There's spells, there's ghosts, there's like all these things. So when you take these simple, the simple premise that, that this is how you get glow to happen, that you essentially just like blur things, um, that is that that then has to go through the uh, into the toolbox of how you problem solve. So for instance, if we want to go back to that original premise of uh, a ball, an actual ball this time, not a circle, we're gonna fill it. And we want this thing to glow, but we also want it to have dimension or something like that. Let's say we want it to be like a, it's like a, a, a glowy rubber ball. So it's, it's hollow in the middle. So how do we want to do that? And how do we want to communicate the glow? Well, there's a few tricks that we can do to do that. Now this isn't going to just be glow, but 
I think it's gonna show just like how useful like Gaussian blur is and how you can do like little tricks. So let's quickly duplicate this. Wait, do I wanna duplicate this? Yeah, let's go ahead and duplicate it. That's kind of a useless step, but let's uh, quickly fill the whole canvas too. We'll come back to this guy on top later. Um, now we want to turn this off just because it'll be a little bit clearer. I'm gonna select it and then I'm gonna clear away from this big fill I've got. So now I've just got this hole right here. What I'm trying to do, or where I'm going with this, is I want to communicate that transparency of the, of the glowy ball, the glowy sphere that happens in the middle. Because as you go to the edges of something that is hollow and see-through, you it's where it starts collecting more matter, I guess you could say. You're starting to see instead of through, instead of seeing perpendicularly through, you're seeing it uh, as it curves away from you, which means you're actually looking through more of its material and it's getting thicker from your point of view. God, I don't think I explained that well, but maybe. Um, so we're gonna blur this. And you can see now we have just like this big blurry thing. We're gonna reselect that circle and select the inverse. You hit this button at the bottom. And then we're gonna clear. And now you can see we have something, oops, we have something that looks kind of like a bubble. Depending, oh here, actually, before I get to that, let's just turn this circle back on. Obviously we can't see shit because it's all the same color. So let's lower its opacity like that. So now you can see that we're starting to get the, the sphere that, that is kind of clear. Now, here's where you have to make the judgment call on exactly how clear it is. Do you duplicate this layer some more so that you get that? Or do you maybe make a, let's delete that layer. What if you instead did this, select clear, so you're running this process again, but then you want to blur it more. You want it to encroach like way more. Then you duplicate that and merge it, select your ball, invert, and clear. And you can see here, this is very different from this. This is communicating two different things. And then if you adjust this opacity, you're really changing what you're trying to communicate. Here, you're communicating that it very rapidly gathers matter along the edges and it's becoming opaque. Whereas, in, and then in the middle, you can almost see perfectly through it. If you turn it up a little, which, which by the way, this is usually implying more light than it is anything else. Then you turn up that middle part and you are controlling how opaque the ball is. Obviously you go all the way to 100%. It's just a hard billiard ball, basically. And um, so I do this on a lot of things. This is the exact same way, if I were to take this layer and just go to black with it, this is the exact same way you can do a vignetting too, on your form. Now, lastly, let's go back to the way it was. If you now want this to also glow, let's turn this layer back on that we had. I'm gonna move it uh, down below just because it it's more logical even though it doesn't have to be there. Let's blur it and then let's reselect our circle here and clear from that glow. And now we have our glowing see-through sphere. So the secret to, uh, oh actually, we can even then, whoops, we can even then change the color of that and it really changes the vibe of it. So with those simple changes and Gaussian blur, we can dramatically, uh, we can create dramatic glows very, very simplistically. Now I implore you to do more experimentation, uh, like what happens when you just take like a fuzzy brush set to white on an ad layer and just like go to town. Like what is, what does that do with your glow? See how it gets like really hot in certain spots, like right there. Oh my God, that's the biggest brush ever. It gets pretty hot right there as I adjust it. Anyways, point is, is that uh, you should now take these techniques and you should go experiment. Play with different layer settings, play with different blurs, try all of these things. You're going to run into some issues. I encourage you to just keep trying new things and then you'll find the way that the the, the glow uh, can work for you.
this has been a valuable video. Um, here I'll leave you with a black and white version. I think it's fun to do black and white versions of these characters because it kind of is like a wink wink nudge nudge to the classic Universal Monsters. Even though, again, these aren't supposed to be exactly that, there's definitely kind of that very light referencing happening. So doing the black and white is just a fun little thing. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. And if you're looking for me on the internet, these are the places you can find me.